So are you beginning to think about retirement? And if you are, you're probably wondering, how much is enough? How much money do I need to actually save to reach my retirement goals? Well, in this video, we're going to cover off seven questions that you need to ask yourself to help you quantify how much will be enough for you. And at the end of the video, we'll talk about a process that will bring all those pieces together so that you can know exactly the number you need to be shooting for so that you will have enough. Well, welcome to All Things Retirement. My name is Sean Humphreys, and uh, we're posting content all the time. So if you don't want to miss future content, make sure you hit subscribe. And as well, if you want to find out how you can get a complimentary retirement forecast and access to educational retirement resources, go to the show notes and there's links to that information. Okay, let's talk about those seven critical questions. So the first question you need to ask yourself is what will your lifestyle cost? How much after-tax income do you need to be delivering to your bank account every month to maintain your retirement lifestyle? Now, if you keep a budget already, you might have a pretty good idea of that number. But if you don't, a starting point will be how much after-tax income are you getting currently before you retire? And don't make assumptions that your lifestyle costs are going to fall dramatically. Your after-tax expenses probably will be maintained because you may be doing other activities. You might be traveling more. So the first thing is get clear on your after-tax income needs. And when you take a look at your expenses, the other thing you should do is a bit of homework. What are your basic non-discretionary costs that will never change? What about additional lifestyle costs? So when you do your planning, we have this idea of the go-go years, the slow-go years, and the no-go years. And so on the front end of your retirement, you probably want more net after-tax income to do the extra things, travel, experiences. And then what are the periodic costs? Replacing a vehicle from time to time, maybe renovations on your home. So those are really important areas to get clear on because it's your after-tax costs that drives everything. We have in the show notes a link to a cash flow planning course. I'd encourage you to take a look at that and use that course to get clear on what your lifestyle costs will be when you retire. So the next question you need to ask is, what province do you live in? And what province do you plan to live in when you retire? Are you planning to make a move? So often people will do that because they're moving to a, a location that has um, beautiful vistas, maybe recreational activities, uh, maybe a nicer climate. But there are trade-offs. Sometimes when you do that kind of move, it, real estate costs are more. Uh, maybe property taxes might be more. And what are the you know taxes you'll pay when you move to that jurisdiction? So one great way of checking that out is this tax calculator that you'll see on your screen. Ernst & Young um, has a great tax calculator, eytaxcalculators.com. I'm in the 2024 personal tax calculator. I think the default is $75,000 of income, but you can go in and enter your income that you want to use. Now, what you begin to see is if I'm in Quebec, $75,000 of income, total tax payable, uh, provincial and federal is $17,439. If I go to Alberta, it's $15,258, and BC, believe it or not, is $13,819. So, there's a big difference jurisdictionally from these various provinces. People are sometimes surprised uh, that BC's uh, provincial federal tax payable is lower than Alberta's. Alberta's a great place uh, to go uh, if you're a business owner. And I think Alberta as well doesn't have sales tax. So most provinces have sales tax. So that's the first thing you need to do um, when you look at this. Look at the tax costs, the real estate costs. Um, there's a whole bunch of factors to take into account. And that's going to drive some of the numbers around how much is it going to cost, how much is enough. So the next question you need to answer is, when do you plan to retire? Now, for some of you, you can't wait to retire. You're 55, there's traveling you want to do, new experiences, or maybe you're just sick of your job, you're frustrated, maybe there's health issues, so you're going to do early retirement. For others of you, you love what you do, and there's flexibility in your career, and you're 65, and you can see yourself working until age 70. Now, what I see has worked best, in my experience, working with hundreds of families as they've transitioned into retirement is not a toggle switch, but a gradual transition. And if you've got a career that allows for that, that's perfect. If you don't, then you may want to begin thinking about side hustles or can I do contract work, other things, so that I still have a little bit of residual income and it's not an on-off switch where I go from being, you know, working full time to all of a sudden being retired. Obviously, all things being equal, if you retire later, you let you need less money. And when you retire earlier, you need more money. And so that's going to drive answers to that question about how much is enough. Now, there's another follow-up question. So the next question is, how long will you live? Who knows, right? But it's interesting. There's been studies that have looked at people's subjective, you know, sort of self-assessment on longevity, and they found that actually people aren't too far off uh, what the reality is. 
So you look at your family. Is there longevity? Do people live a long life? Um, is it shorter life expectancy in your family? Um, if you're a male and you're relatively healthy, you'll probably live until your you know, early 80s from a general life expectancy standpoint. If you're a female, mid 80s, so that might be a starting point. But if people live a long life, you might extend that you know, to a later date. So obviously it's a, it's a bit of a, a self-assessment and then looking at mortality tables. And obviously the longer you think you'll live, the more capital that you'll need. And that means how much will you need, how much is enough is going to be driven by that. Uh, I think it's one of those decision points that, you know, is probably one you need to be cautious on. Probably you want to under-promise and over-deliver. Assume you might live a little bit longer than what you really think you'll live. It's interesting in couple situations, if you're relatively healthy at 65, as a couple, there's well over a 30, I think it's almost a 35% chance that one of you will still be living until your mid-90s. Okay, so it's an important question to answer. And so you've got, when will you retire? And then the next one is, how long will you live? And those numbers will have an impact on how much is enough. Now, the next question to answer, and you would already have the answer to that question likely, is do you have a partner? The unfortunate thing about retirement income planning particularly is it's very strongly biased towards or in favor of couples. And one of the reasons for that is two can live more cheaply than one, typically. And in retirement planning, there's a lot of income tax splitting that can be done. We've done videos on this topic where you can share pension incomes, as an example. Of course, you're sharing you know, common expenses, household expenses. And so that has a huge impact on how much will be enough, right? If you're in a couple situation, that's likely going to be to your advantage. If you're in a single situation, you might argue that is to your advantage. But there are some financial implications that might be somewhat negative, now, the next question to get clear on is, what will inflation be? Well, again, it's one of those questions where you might go, well, who knows? So I think as a starting point, you take a look at the long-term historical inflation rates. You start there. So if you look at Canada the last 20 years, if you used an inflation rate of anywhere from 25 to 3.5%, that's probably a good starting point in terms of doing your calculations on how much do you need, how much is enough. Well, the higher the inflation rate, potentially the more capital that's required in your retirement years. Now, there are exceptions to that. For some people, if they've got defined benefit pension plans that are indexed, have cost of living allowances on them, if you have obviously Canada Pension Plan and Old Age Security, those benefits are fully indexed as well. So for some of you, you've got a lot of your base retirement income that will be cost of living adjusted. So it doesn't really matter what inflation number you use, you're probably okay. But for many Canadians, they might have some pensions and some government benefits, but they rely quite quite a lot on their investment portfolios. So the inflation rates that you use in your calculations will be really, really critical to your planning. But again, the higher the rate, likely the more capital you need, the lower the rate, maybe the less amount of capital. But you need to wrestle with that number and how you're going to handle that. The other thing that you can do is in your planning, you tend to see that the higher inflationary uh, expenses, more discretionary expenses tend to happen in the early years. And what you see with a lot of people that do financial modeling is they'll just take the after-tax expense needs and just increase them every year, let's say at 3% for inflation. The reality is that expenses do tend to plateau as you get older. So when you, when you get into your late 70s, early 80s, you tend to see expenses starting to plateau so that maybe the inflationary pressures may not be quite as uh, extreme for you when in the later years. And then the last question, question number seven that you need to wrestle with is, what kind of returns do you need to get on your investment portfolio for retirement? And again, that's very, very specific to each individual situation. It's really a combination of your investment temperament, what you feel comfortable investing in. And so one example would be money under the mattress investors who might just buy guaranteed investment certificates, T-bills, high-yield savings accounts for their portfolio. Compared to someone who has a balanced portfolio, let's say of some cash, uh, tradable bonds and stocks, to another investor that might have mostly stocks or stock ETFs in their portfolio. Um, over the longer term, that stock portfolio will likely get better performance than the 100% cash equivalents portfolio that has GICs and savings accounts. And so everything else being equal, the more conservative you are, the more capital that you'll need. So how much is enough? Well, you need more if you're really conservative, all things being equal. So I don't think it's a all or nothing kind of decision. I think you have to look at your investment experience. You have to decide what portfolio strategy is right for you based on your risk temperament and then plan from there. 
what I'd like to show you is just a quick chart that summarizes its discussion really, really well. So let's take a look at that right now. So this chart takes a look at uh, investment returns from ver for various categories here. I'll talk about the categories in a second, but we go from uh, June 1st, 2003 to May 31st, 2023. And we're looking at equity fixed income versus the average GIC returns in this example. So it's a very simple example, but what it's showing you is that for uh, investors who had $100,000 to invest back in 2003, uh, that one year GIC portfolio grew to $128,000. So it was up about 28%. And if I look at three year GICs over that time period, that portfolio grew to 140,000. So we're up about 40%. Uh, Canadian aggregate fixed income portfolio, that's basically a bond ETF or index, that 100000 grew to 206000 And if we look at the Canadian stock market as measured by the S&P TSX, um, over that 20-year period, the stock portfolio grew to 497485 so it was up 397%. Now, the challenge when you look at this chart, obviously, is the stock portfolio has more short-term volatility. So although it provided a lot more total return over that time period, you had to weather this volatility. And then if you look at the GIC portfolios, although you didn't have any volatility, your growth was not enough to really deal with purchasing power risk through inflation and then tax costs, right? It's not a great way of building a retirement portfolio over a 20-year period. But I don't think it's all or nothing. I think it's always maybe nuanced and it could be a mix. So if you look at a portfolio made up of 50% Canadian stocks, 30% bonds, and 20% GICs. And by the way, the Canadian stock market was not a great market over that time period. The U.S. market was stronger. But if we use that mix, that portfolio grew um, 239%, so much more than the bond portfolio or the GICs. But it would have had less volatility or year-by-year -year fluctuation. Okay, so... Obviously, when you look at this information, that's going to have a big impact on how much is enough. If you're really cautious in your portfolio, you're going to need a, typically a lot more capital. If you're more of a balanced portfolio, you're going to need less. And then if you're a growth portfolio, you probably need even less than that. The problem is with the growth portfolio, you're never pure growth. You always need to have some money in cash equivalents because if you go through a down market, you need to be able to grab hold of something to fund cash flow while you wait for those assets to recover. So those seven questions are really critical as a way of getting a true sense as to how much is enough specifically for your particular circumstances. Now, once you've gone through those questions, how do you take the answers and begin plotting a specific game plan so that you can confirm how much is enough specifically for you? Well, the way you do that is you have a financial forecast prepared for you. So on the screen, I'm showing you a forecast that we do for our own clients. And you can see in this forecast, it's a whole bunch of data we enter, your pensions, your investments, your cash flow requirements. And we get a pretty good sense as to where you're tracking for retirement. So this couple, this is uh, Sam and Sally YouTube, and they were retiring on their 60th year. They needed $65,000 per year of after-tax income, and then another 10000 per year for some travel expenses for a period of time. We have uh, investment accounts and TFSAs and RSPs. We entered all that data, and then we're able to show them how they're tracking relative to their, to their goals. So you can see that $65,000 per year, they didn't want to reduce it over time. They wanted to keep increasing the expenses to inflation just in case they had health care costs that they would have to absorb. So they didn't want to plateau the expenses. We then have the darker blue here, which is their travel expenses, and the red represents tax costs, which actually go down over time, and I'll show you why in a second. Now, this is where the income is coming from. This is pre-tax income sources. So we've got the old age security benefits. We've got their Canada Pension Plan benefits, which they decided to take early. We've got the RSP RIF payments, and you can see in this chart that those payments are depleted fully by age 85. And then we've got their TFSA payments, which begin in their 85th year to age 90. So we had them living to age 90. And what you see on the balance sheet here is they're fully funding their goals. So the blue represents their real estate, which was never used to fund cash flow. The blue here, the lighter blue, is your RIF account, which was fully depleted by their 84th year. And then the TFSA account kept growing. And then by their 85th, 84th year, they began using that account. So it's slowly going down. And that's one of the reasons when you look at their total income uh, taxes, uh, went down almost basically to zero by their late 80s. So what they were able to do is to confirm that they have enough 
right? They have enough to reach their goals and objectives. So this complimentary forecast you can access. And what we do is we go over the base case. And invariably what happens is we find that people have some gaps. We do a gap analysis. There's probably some further planning that needs to be done. And we talk about how we assist people with that additional planning. Anyway, I hope that you found this video helpful. How much is enough? It's very specific, but you can make a lot of progress if you answer those seven questions and then get your own customized analysis for your circumstances. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you do that so you don't miss future content. And if you want to find out more information about our complimentary resources and retirement forecasts, go to the show notes. There are links back to our website. Anyway, wishing you all the best in your retirement and overall wealth planning. You take care. Bye-bye.